Welcome to Being the Genuine Athlete podcast, where we inspire those who aim for excellence in life and want to understand the how and what it takes to be a champion in life. My name is Jura Koschak. My purpose, dedication and commitment is to activate your potential, that you understand the ego through your sport and life situations. So I share and give you the tools to be just this, the genuine athlete. Are you ready to tune in? Thank you for being available, uh, Nikki and Nicola, uh, for this podcast, Being the Genuine Athlete. I feel, as my girlfriend Anya, former tennis player, uh, told me that you are an authentic person, so that is why I invited you. I'm very honored. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, first, uh, I'm going to begin to introduce you, and you can add your life in this. Uh, as my girlfriend explained me, you are a professional tennis uh, player on the WTA Tour. Uh, mainly focused on doubles? Yes, right. Uh, since when have you been a professional? So I um, graduated from school in 2007 and right after I, I focused on tennis and started traveling more intensely from beginning starting 2008, I would say, and did this a couple of years until 2015 when I started to focus on doubles. This was because of uh, ongoing problems with injuries with my body and I was um, tired of coming back, getting a good ranking, being injured. That happened a couple of times. So I thought, okay, I'm going to give it a shot playing doubles because I've always been enjoying playing doubles. And um, this felt for me was, uh, was the right step. And maybe a little push into the right direction for me. We will go back to doubles and the difference between the individual and doubles. But what were you doing also in between uh, your career? Uh, because you have a long career already, some years, more than 10 years. If you introduce yourself a bit regarding your maybe education that you did uh, alongside studies, maybe some uh, in, uh, that you invested your time also in a foundation. What's about that? Yeah, so um, after school, when I graduated, I started a studies and, um, in social science. But yeah, after a few semesters, I figured out that wasn't the right thing for me. And then in 2015, I started um, to study international management at a university in south of Germany, where, which, uh, where, where they have a special program for athletes. So I could do a lot from home and it was part-time, not full-time. And that uh, allowed me to be quite flexible with dates and with the um, subjects that, that I was going to take. So, and I'm almost about to finish this. So after this year's summer, yeah, I'm going to have a bachelor in um, international management. Let's hope so. <laughs> and... Um, so there, there was my second sec, uh, second studies, and between that, I did um, coaching certifications through the WTA. They're having a great program for current pros or ex-professional tennis players, and so I did my coaching certifications, um, and I have the PDR and um, USPTA coaching certification, which yeah helps me um, or helped me a lot. Um, yeah, to give lessons here, to have an, an extra financial income and to make some extra money because it's hard to live from the prize money in doubles only. And um, yeah, I started to do commentating last year, which I've been enjoying a lot for two channels for was last year for an internet channel called The Zone. And this year I was allowed to commentate a couple of matches for Eurosport, which was cool during the Australian Open. And um, I'm ambassador for a charity organization in Frankfurt, which is called Dumus Kempen, which means translated, you have to fight. Inspired by them, I was um, hosting my own charity event last year, which was a tennis tournament during the day and a charity party in the evening, and which was a lot of work, but also a lot of fun and totally worth it. So uh, still raising money throughout the year for a German, German hospital for kids who are undergoing chemotherapy to allow them to have a sports therapy. As you can hear, I'm quite busy next to tennis, not only playing tennis and practicing, but yeah, I'm studying, doing my charity work. And yeah, all this makes uh, every day different and very interesting. As I had experience, I was a professional table tennis player uh, and I had experience with table tennis, but now in the last years that I'm together with Anya, more and more with tennis and tennis players, 
and uh, I coached some, uh, mentally coached some of them. And the thing was that they were very focused and obsessed only with tennis and maybe PlayStation or some, you know, free time occupation, but uh, tennis were the, was the main uh, occupation. But so I'm thrilled and excited that you are so open and altruistic as well and uh, that you've expanded your web of influence, of impact in your life. That's, that's very great. Yeah, I think you have to find a, a good balance. Because at the, at the beginning of my tennis career, I was thinking, oh, okay, it's not professional to do something else while playing tennis. But then I figure out there are times during the year when I'm having more time, like in, during the off season or when you're injured. And I can, I was thinking, okay, I could spend these times more useful. So, and then during times maybe when I was injured, I felt like, okay, I can use this time um, for my education and I'm feeling less lost if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and I think it's, it's, it's really important to obviously focus on tennis and being professional, but normally you do have some spare time. And I think it's very important to already prepare your post-career job during your career. Because otherwise, when once tennis is not going well, or you're injured, or you, for some reasons, you have to retire from your sports, you might fall into a very dark place which is not going to happen if you already prepare yourself for your retirement during your career i think that's very important and gives you more options and obviously also less pressure on your tennis mm -hmm. because if, if you only have plan a i think it, it's going to be more more pressure you put more pressure on yourself more expectations and that's um, i think that's very important and you can see from other athletes i think those who have prepared their retirement before let's say like michael jordan which is a great example it's not very likely that he's falling into a deep depression because he, he has, he has then a different job and he keeps himself busy also after his career. And I think that's very important to um, when the day comes to be prepared for your, let's say, next chapter. Yeah, this soft transition. Uh, I heard Maria Sharapova as well talk about this, how she was working on herself and educating in business wise and preparing uh, already along her career. The thing is also that uh, I mean, with Anya, we visited some of the conferences on Grand Slams. We participated in some, and there was a lot of talk on these uh, on the WTCA, the Women's Tennis uh, yeah. Association. Uh, they talked a lot about how much tennis can give you in life. Please give me your experience uh, regarding yourself and other players that you've met with and played with. How were they able? to educate uh, and not be only influenced by the result, by the outcome that they were aspiring to, their ambitions, but that they were able to, uh, because as a tennis player, uh, you, you have physical coach or training. Uh, you need to take care of your nutrition, your psychology, uh, your techniques, tactics. So it's a broad, it's like studies. I was studying sport and uh, playing, like being obsessed in a positive way and so ambitious in one sport and, and focused gives you very broad horizon of different knowledge and science and everything. Uh, so how was your experience with yourself and others that they were able to uh, acknowledge that uh, different, you know, approaches and different knowledge that came in their life? Yeah. So first of all, I love that you've been to the conferences because I'm friends with Sarah Stone also yeah. who's organizing it. Yeah. So I think that's a great input. So, you know, it depends a little bit. You know, there are some players who are already very good at a young age. So I think um, everything to them is served from the outside. So they're having probably a nutritionist, they're having a fitness trainer, they're having a physiotherapist and the tennis coach. So I don't think they're going, some of them, yes. So I heard that, like, for example, Andy Murray, he's obsessed with um, building up knowledge about what he's doing, why, and he always asks, why are we doing this? Or why are we doing that? So he's asking his fitness coach that. Yeah. So, but not all, all players are like that. So some of them are getting everything served and they don't even ask it. And if they're lucky, they're having a good team and they don't even need to. But I mean, I'm, um, I'm a doubles player and I've never been, let's say, top 50 in singles in the world. So I was also getting more, I was starting to, um, you know, finding out more about, let's say, nutrition. When I got injured, I was going into research. Okay, what can I do or how can I, how can I change my, um, my nutrition to be less injured or to have less inflammation in my body? And I think it's, it has never been easier to get information as nowadays. Like 15 years back, you had to go into the library to find information. Now we can Google everything. 
So I think that was very easy. And of course, you have to be careful with what you're reading and always have to make sure you have good sources of information. But um, yeah, I was getting also very deep into this topic of nutrition and um, I'm living vegan now. So, and but also because I was, I was trying out what works for me. And um, yeah, fitness wise and nutrition wise, I think these two fields, I think there's not many topics where you have so many different opinions. And I think at some point you have to not just listen to somebody, but also li to somebody else, but listen to your body and try to feel and try out what works for you. So stretching, yes or no, you have to like also figure out what works for your body, what's important what helps you on the court and off the court. Yeah, and also to be in a good balance, yeah, according to your soul, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's important to get your mind off tennis and you really need to, and of course it gets, gets easier the older you get because you have more experience, but mm -hmm. I just think it's, it's really important to, to figure out what works for you. It's, um, I also try sometimes try to, to speak to people that I respect and where I think, okay, they have a huge knowledge. So one thing is getting into contact with them and not being shy to ask mm -hmm. because normally people are open to help. Doing an experiment on yourself, what works for me, what doesn't, um, of course, in a way which is healthy. And this is um, a hard thing to balance the ambitious and the results that we are all ego driven and we, we need results in a way, certain outcomes to support our life. Uh, if you play for sponsors and you want to achieve uh, as, um, some results, and on the other side, give yourself time, space, uh, awareness to acknowledge uh, everything that is needed. Uh, how did you uh, see that? As you've mentioned already now, some bits uh, that you could talk to some people, that you asked, you were very interested uh, about this, uh, also everything else, because you didn't have the support that maybe Coco Golf now has or some other athletes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, how did you see this? Uh, balancing out of some athletes that were really only focused on results and ambitious and were like maybe arrogant and mm -hmm. some athletes that were more open because they were like that people but I'm not saying that others that were arrogant didn't have these abilities to be friendly but maybe yeah. they pushed away everything because they were just so occupied with results yeah so I also one time when I changed coaches so we were working on some stuff and um, at the beginning my ranking dropped a little bit, but then after the things that we were working on were working well in matches, mm -hmm. so I had my career high. So sometimes it's also process, and if you're trusting the process, you sometimes have to accept that at the beginning or in some periods, you might have a little bit worse results, but have to trust the process that in the end, it's going uh, it's gonna to work out. And this is only possible if you're surrounded by a team that you totally trust and you know um, that works for you. Yeah, and for me, I felt like I had to take, I had to make some decisions, scheduling-wise, let's say. Okay, so I could make one schedule where I, I was, I would be on the road for let's say six weeks far away, or I could, I, I could do like a, a schedule where I would only be on the road three to four weeks. And I know that maybe uh, this schedule would be work out better for me because maybe I have better results. Of course, I have a bigger, bigger chance to make good results the more tournaments I play. But I felt like, okay, being away from home for so long is going to make me suffer. So I made a decision and say, okay, for me, I'm going to make a schedule where I feel, okay, I'll be on the road for three weeks, four weeks, totally focused, which makes more sense um, than being away for six weeks. Even though statistically, of course, you have a bigger chance to have good results the more you play. But then you have to make a decision. Okay, oh no, I'm going to feel homesick after three weeks. So I'm going to do a smart schedule that works for me. And that's something you have to figure out by yourself. Talking to your coaches, talking to your parents and make a decision that you feel comfortable with. Because it's, I think you're only having good results when you're feeling um, at peace with yourself and when you feel comfortable and you're not missing your home so badly. So I think that's when you're making your good results. And I think you can see this on many athletes. When they're surrounded by a team they can trust or when they are feeling, feeling good about their private life. And I think that's, that matters the most, especially in women's tennis, where I think the emotional aspect and is more, more important than on the men's tour, let's say. And they're very sensitive. And I think if all these pe puzzle pieces are coming together, that's when you have your best results. Yeah, so the results are a consequence. Yeah. 
uh, just to emphasize more on this, uh, how did you see for yourself or others, because you mentioned a lot, but we will get back to this. Uh, how did you see that athletes, your maybe friends, uh, female friends, ladies, were aware of that results are a consequence, not just that you strive like in a hamster wheel, you want those results and you work so hard, but that you listen to your body because in ladies, you have uh, your things with uh, like period and other uh, emotions and hormonal stuff that maybe men we do not have. So all praise to ladies. Yeah. It's much more difficult for you to schedule, to be uh, like on top of it, but yes. you listen to yourself and understand and trust even not maybe to coaches and, and people surrounding you, but trust life itself that it will give you after the process, the results. Yeah. So there's, there's many players, uh, men and women's both. So they're only going hard, hard, very hard on themselves, going after going more, um, more practices and more, not on the, not, not so much relying on the quality of their practices, more on the quantity. So and they, they have to push themselves, they, they have to practice harder, 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 and then you're going to be burned out at some point. So you have many examples of players who were, were already good at a very young age and practicing really a lot. And then sometimes the, um, yeah, the results or the effects of this training you only experience a couple of years later, so that you're already burned out at 22, let's say. Mm -hmm. And there, there's, there's many advantages. I don't want to... I don't want to say names, but there are many, many examples, uh, many examples of, of players who are very good at a young age and then got uh, many injuries during their careers. So, and I think for me also, sometimes I think, oh my God, I cannot skip this training because I'm tired. I don't want to be lazy. I want to be professional. And then um, maybe I got sick a couple of days later because my, my body was, I don't know, was, um, didn't have a lot of energy and I still pushed myself through this practice. And I think it's a very... A very typical thing to know when to give yourself a break and sometimes to push through. Mm -hmm. I have some, some days where I feel maybe a little bit fatigue or I'm not so motivated. And on those days, you really have to push yourself through a practice. But then on some days when you really feel weak and empty and don't have a lot of power, then it's sometimes even better to give yourself a break or to step off the court, do something else, go for a walk or just try to stay away from tennis. And that's, that's so difficult. And I think this is something you learn over experience. And even nowadays, I'm on the tour already for 10 years, sometimes not making the right decision. But it's, it's, it really is a process. So to give your, give your body a rest. And I think younger players don't see that or think, okay, if I skip this practice, I'm unprofessional mm -hmm. and um, I'm lazy. So it, it's really difficult to, to make the right decisions. And, and again, then it's so important to have a good team around you who helping a little bit and saying, okay, now you should take a break or, or even coaches, they have their program. And I work with coaches before every practice, they ask me, so how do you feel? You cannot make, it's also, I read this in the book about Andre Agassi. So you cannot make your, your schedule, training schedule for two weeks. I think you have to see, okay, every day, how do you feel? You can have a rough schedule, obviously, but yeah, I think you have to um, rethink no, this every day. Yeah. Rethink this every day and see how you feel and maybe you can do more when you're feeling feeling well and maybe sometimes you have to do less so i think it's it's something very flexible and nothing that should be too too strict mm -hmm. you know and that's that's something that i've learned also because sometimes i was pushing myself the practices and um, being very tired and i think this practice didn't get me anywhere because it didn't have a very good quality or sometimes it makes sense even to shorten practices when you feel you don't have a lot of energy. And I really, really do think um, the quality is so much more important than the quantity, especially when you get older. I yeah. think also Roger Federer, when he was younger, he was practicing more than he does today. But I don't think the intensity and the quality is, is, is better. It's even better today or at the same level as it used to be. Yeah. That's the thing with knowing yourself and getting all these different inputs and, and understanding all the factors that are involved in the equation towards success. And for me, success is not only some result and that you then fall down, but that you yeah. can maintain, be consistent, not maybe with results, always achieving finals or semifinals or quarters, but achieving your balance inside because that is what gives you the stability, the stamina. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, because we are always measured by numbers. So are you a number one, number 10, number 100 in the world? You're always, as a tennis player, you're a number. 
you know, you, in like let's say in team sports, it's it's not like that. Obviously, you you want to be in a in a good position um, in your in your division, mm-hmm. but it, it's not as it's extreme as it is in in tennis. And I would say, and so as a tennis player, you have to be aware of the fact that not one single match is important. It's important what's happening at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And um, to also make sure you're developing, developing your personality and your your worth as a person is not depending on your on your results or your ranking. So that's also something that I had to learn because I thought, okay, I'm a I'm more I'm worthy when I'm having a good ranking, but when tennis is not going well, I mean I'm still the same person. Mm-hmm. So that's something very very important that I had to learn. Yeah, good that you learned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you maybe know, uh, have you heard about the female triangle? So the period, bone density and energy deficit, how it's all connected. I haven't never gotten really that much into, into it, no. No, it's, uh, it's one, not theory, but idea and, and, and actually science, how uh, coaches are being now. I've heard this on the WTCA uh, conferences, thanks to Sarah uh, Stone. And one guy presented this in a way that coaches need to really understand uh, because mainly there are male coaches in the female tennis and mm-hmm. they do not ask or understand regarding period and how it is affecting the bone density and the energy deficit. So mm-hmm. it's a very connected triangle. And as you said, it's good that your coaches ask you, how do you feel before the training? They had a schedule and, and the main plan, but uh, they needed to adapt. So I heard some tennis players, uh, ladies have also stopped their period with some uh, advice, devices or something uh, yeah. that they blocked it. Uh, they had some inhibitors, and that's all the competitive world. How did you find yourself in this female uh, being a lady and uh, needing needing to compete so much? Because competing competition is a male world, and it is it has affected your body. You had some injuries or maybe something else regarding also psychology or mental stuff. How did you see all that together? So yeah, I think it should. I think, yeah, it should play a bigger role in your scheduling, not not tournament scheduling, but also practice scheduling. I personally have never been so much affected by the cycles, but I know that many, I think, a high percentage of, of athletes are on birth control, which means um, you can control your period or you can avoiding it. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a different story if that's healthy or not, but I think yeah, many of the athlete, athletes are trying to control it. So... Um, so the, um, it, the period is less less natural, and I've heard from some from coach who's who's working in uh, track and field that he's also talked to his um, a- female athletes about it. So when is your period? And yeah, to adjust the practice. And I think that's. But I think nowadays coaches don't even are afraid to ask. Don't know much. Don't know about about it either. So they have no idea what it's like as, as a male coach and they don't, don't speak to their athletes. It's more like a taboo topic. So, um, but I might I've... Add, sorry to interfere. I might add here, as I have uh, had experience with my clients that I coach uh, and also athletes, uh, what I say to ladies is, please, ladies, invite us to your world. Because yeah. if you say this is mine or uh, do not look at my blood or something like that, yeah. you, you, you make this barrier and we men cannot enter uh, into your world and we cannot know what it is about. So th- that's why it's sort of, I'm not uh, saying that you are responsible, that that's your guilt, ladies, yeah. guys. But in a way, uh, if ladies invite uh, coaches and also other people like men uh, into their world, that they explain and talk about more what they feel, how they feel, what it is about hormones, what is a natural process and a very, as you mentioned, unnatural with birth control pills and contraception and other stuff, how they manipulate uh, wrongly because the consequences are big with with hormonal wise yeah so i think so i personally i'm not so affected by it but i know some other players who are like during the period they're having crimes they're feeling weak and it's it's a pretty big deal i mean you don't have to go into detail with your coach about it if you're feeling uncomfortable but you can tell them look there's a um, couple days in the month where i'm having less energy and you just it's important to to make them understand, make them know, and then to adjust the practice. Mm-hmm. So that's it. But I don't think maybe one out of, one out of hundred coaches ask their players about their yeah about their experience during their their period. 
So I don't think anyone ever hardly asks, you know, and I think, yeah, it's, it's something you should, should consider and you should, you should talk about, um, consider in a way that you adjust your practice. And uh, how were your, you mentioned some of your injuries, uh, what did happen or why were you tired? Did you didn't listen to your body or was it something else or? So yeah, a couple of times I, I could tell it was from, I was tired. I was just um, practicing too much and not doing enough for my recovery. So, you know, if, um, so I think, I think that's something also, I mean, you have good examples like Novak Djokovic. I think on every day of practice, he, at the end of the day, he stretches for one hour. So he's very professional about it. And Recap. I don't think, prevention. Yes. yeah, so prevention, recovery. And I think um, you keep practicing all the time, but you still don't spend a lot, enough time on these kind of things, on let's say yoga, stretching, ice bath, and whatever there is. Uh, and um, so I think I was, I was also um, not doing, doing enough in that field. As I'm, now, as I'm doing now and also obviously when you're top 10 in the world you have your private physio you get can get massages every day it's different but um also you just you try to do the best even if you're not having that that big of a budget so i think this was one reason that i was that i was practicing a lot and not doing enough for my recovery and the other reason also was sometimes when i felt mentally tired and i didn't listen to it also, when I when I felt okay, I was mentally tired. I was in a personally in a difficult situation that I got injured. Like my body was fit, but I felt like okay, yeah, I was I was um, in a in difficult situation in my in my private life or my personal life. Then I get injured, and somehow my, um, my I got injured because my my body is trying to give me signals. You need a break. Yeah, and time, space. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, I don't know if that sounds too spiritual, but it, I, I really no, believe that's... I had um, the same. I had the same. I, mean, I wasn't a spiritual 15, 20 years ago, and I had the same. When I was uh, physically and mentally tired, something happened. I was sick or something happened and the body was giving me time. That's, yeah, so, yeah, so I, that's why I think your body is, um, is taking its time, you know? Your body is giving you signals. And um, I also, maybe because of the, let's say, the latest injury that I had during my singles career, maybe I was thinking, okay, maybe your body is giving you signals that for you the right thing to do is playing doubles. My body was actually making the decision for me. And that was the best thing I could do, what happened to me. So I focused on doubles and I was a lot happier than I was before playing singles. And that was definitely a good decision for me because sometimes I really think you should listen to your body giving you signals and signs and trying to push you into the right direction, maybe by an injury or, yeah. And yeah it's so learning the lesson, learning the lesson. Yeah, yeah so, so that was why sometimes, yeah, I think it's so important to spend a lot of time on, on recovery, whatever that is. Let's say, I don't know, sauna, stretching, cool pool, whatever that is for you. And also to listen to your body, as I just said, and also try to keep your mind-body in a good balance. So uh, you mentioned now that you listened to yourself, to your yeah. body, and your body, it means your brain as well, your mind as well, and your emotions. Uh, so yeah. you uh, began to play more doubles. Uh, what do you see the difference for you personally is, uh, because you mentioned that you were much more happier, was it only physically or also psychologically pressure-wise, the, the, the transmission, the difference? Both, yeah. absolutely both. Because I, for me, felt felt I was enjoying it more when I could, could share the court with someone. Mm -hmm. So you can experience together. And I was always been a team player, I would say. So that's why I was enjoying it more because you enjoy, can enjoy a victory or you can go through maybe a tough loss with your, together with your partner and you, you're working on, on things together with your partner. And um, yeah, I felt less, less pressure on myself as well. I felt less lonely, mm -hmm. if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so because uh, because I um, never had a huge budget, so I was always traveling by myself. Also, when I was playing singles, I felt lonely at times. So and then when I started to play doubles, uh, you're always having a partner by your side, and that also involves that maybe off the court you're doing more with your partner. Maybe you go mm -hmm. for dinner and stuff. So um, yeah, all all this package was was um, making me feel more comfortable. Also um, playing, being able to play bigger events in doubles than I was then playing in singles. So for me, it was more enjoyable to play bigger WTA uh, events or even Grand Slams than playing smaller ITF tournaments in singles. So, so for me, that 
that was more enjoyable to play the bigger events and that mm-hmm. that's what I was aiming for and so yeah that all this package was making me more yeah happy and more comfortable yeah uh, so after all this um, experience that you gained uh, with playing doubles and going into that direction if you look back could you have sensed or did you already sense that when you were in your 20s earlier like uh, beginning of your career that you could have played doubles or somebody maybe maybe mentioned it to you some coach or parents or somebody why don't you play more doubles but you were like no no i want to be in singles so yeah so that's that's a little bit yeah that there was so now looking back i think oh my i should have focused on doubles sooner so to to be i think i probably i would have been more successful but on the other hand like playing singles and having this this dream about being top 100 in the world and um something it's so hard to let go it's really hard to let go and now looking back i i know it, i should have probably focused on doubles sooner but on the other hand now i know i tried everything mm-hmm. yeah. in singles so if i had started to to focus on doubles already when i was 22 let's say i would think oh maybe you could have been top 100 in singles this is maybe something yeah. that i would regret on the other hand you know whatever you whatever you do yeah, it's yeah. always it's two-sided it's always two-sided so so yeah looking back now because i felt much happier focusing on novels i think i should have focused sooner on novels so you could get into more into specific practices because you practice differently but on the other hand i know i tried everything to get the best out of me in singles and it's not that i i don't know retired from singles too soon or then I, maybe i would think oh i should have given it uh, another try or should, I should give it another shot so so that's, um, I don't have any regret about it. Yeah, and look, now looking back, also some coaches were pushing me into this direction now. And then um, uh, at the end of the day, that was a good decision for me. Mm-hmm. But yeah. You mentioned also that uh, you are becoming or that you already are a certified coach. And mm-hmm. as a coach, uh, I, uh, I think that you will or you already are looking at your uh, students or players, maybe if they are young or not young. And you can, with your experience now, not influence, but maybe guide them or give them the perspective, and not in this way that they will regret uh, if they do not try everything in being singles, but maybe you can guide a girl into playing doubles sooner. Uh, not that you repay, uh, remake your mistake or anything, because it wasn't a mistake, as you know, but maybe guide someone out of that single obsession, being singles, good in singles, because it sometimes is an obsession, especially if you do not achieve or maybe if some injuries are there of course you learn and everything is as it's supposed to be but maybe some guide someone on that path earlier yeah absolutely so i also i mean sometimes i do see players on tour let's doesn't matter if it's boys or girls so i'll say oh geez uh, you should you should you should be really good in doubles i think very it will work for you very quickly. I think somebody would have a lot of success, but there, so many of them are still sticking to singles, maybe for similar reasons than what I did it, you know, and then, then of course, I would guide them or trying to push them into the right direction. I mean, you've got many examples where players, um, yeah, were very successful after their focus on doubles. And some of them, I think they would have never even been top 200 in singles, mm-hmm. let's say. And from my experience, of course, I would... I would always advise my players, to, even if they're successful in singles, to sometimes do play doubles to have a side thing. So, so for periods when it's not going well in singles, let's let's say Timia Babos, yeah, top ten and Grand Slam champion in doubles. And I think now in a period when the singles is not going well, this helps you a lot. It helps you financially and confidence-wise. So it's I would always advise players to have doubles on the side and then um, and having not too big of a gap between the two rankings because if you have a really high single rankings and a low doubles rankings you're not gonna get into doubles on the bigger tournaments so I would always advise them to to play both and then a little bit I think then you see the development the development of your rankings you experience what you enjoy and then at some point make a decision and uh, that is my purpose and intention and what I'm committed to to give this uh, genuine, authentic touch to athletes that they do not not struggle so much, maybe that they shorten this gap of struggle. We all need and we will all have struggle in life, some adversity in a positive way, struggle. Being genuine and authentic to yourself that you know that maybe, as you mentioned, you you were more 
of a social person and you were lonely. So in yeah. that way, I think it's good to know yourself. And uh, that is how I use uh, decoding numbers. I don't know if Anya mentioned to you or you saw our presentation from New York, uh, how we use and, and apply this knowledge of decoding a person regarding numbers, name and the birth of date and how we see exactly and pinpoint the maybe the issue, the block and something that a person is more open to. Uh, and that helps a lot. Are you using some method like that? Maybe some evaluation or after your experience, maybe you don't have some psychology evaluation uh, that you use in your coaching, but you have your experience that you can read the person. So yeah, I can I mean I can only talk speak for myself. Or when when I when I look at myself, um, I'm trying to um, yeah make a conclusion. Or also like after half half of the year, I say okay, let's um, let's regroup or talk to my talk to my coach. Or also even only for myself, um, I try to yeah make a conclusion for the first part of the year. And sometimes also when I'm at tournaments to write a diary to see how I feel because sometimes when you're when you're when you're back home you don't you don't even remember how did you feel when you were there mm -hmm. so and I think it's I, I started to just just write diaries to see how I feel or how I felt back then and to see okay what it would I do, what did I do in practice what did I do on the mental side that worked for me well and, and what did I do when I had my best results what can I do better scheduling wise or training wise and um, yeah, I do also like write down goals, write diary for just, yeah, for me personally to see how I, how I felt and what, what can I improve, but I'm not using a system as you were talking about. Great, great that, uh, that you mentioned this, uh, because when you are on the tournament, when the trigger is happening, then you can feel something because at home you are in your own bubble world routine. It's not trigger wise, so uh, uh, open. Uh, maybe in the kitchen where you are now, there are some triggers sometimes, but otherwise on the tennis court or on tennis matches, tennis training, good, good, uh, good guidance and instruction. Thank you for that. Yeah, because I think sometimes when you're home, you, and I think it's not only tennis, it's in, in also in other jobs. Mm -hmm. so you, you really, or when you had surgery, sometimes you try to, when you're back in your everyday life, you, you, you push back the negative feelings and you mm -hmm. forget them. Mm -hmm. And then you, and that what then happens, you're getting back into the same situation again. That's the value that uh, these, uh, you know, so you don't happen. learn from it. So, yeah. so, okay, let's say I, I was, I had a surgery or I had a, I don't know, I had a bad match or I was at a tournament in a shitty place. And then I write it down how I felt. And then being back home, you normally, you would think, oh, it wasn't that bad because you, I think your, your mind pushed back mm -hmm. the negative emotions or the negative or the pain or the negative experiences and then you tend to do it again when you look back and maybe read what did i write down i was at a let's say terrible place at a tournament and i felt so uncomfortable i don't want to come here again uh, maybe going back home you would think you would making your schedule for next year and you say oh it wasn't that bad actually because you, you, I think the human being tends to forget or to push away negative emotions. And I think it's really important to, to yeah, I mean, just to write it down or really try to remember what it felt like to avoid uh, making the same mistakes all over again, if that makes sense. Huh? Yeah, yeah, great. And I think also this is maybe why, why people still having babies, because they push back these negative emotions and all the pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, getting a second child. Huh? Yeah, our friend just recently, less than two weeks ago, she uh, had a second uh, son born and just a couple of hours before she went to, into the labor, she was like, now I remember, oh my God, it yeah. hurt the first time I had pain. So yeah, maybe we can now uh, head into your altruistic charit, charit, charitable nature with Andrea Petkovic's uh, foundation because uh, you were now... Um, emphasizing and putting a light on your awareness, consciousness, how you write down stuff, how you went through difficult situations and adversities and surgery. And that made you a person that you are able to be empathy wise, open, and that you want to be a part of this foundation that you are and that you made your uh, project as well. Yeah, so I, um, I attended this charity tournament in Frankfurt. And there was a group of amazing people who were founding this charity. 
And um, yeah, Andrea Petkovic is ambassador of, uh, of that charity. It's called Du musst kämpfen, which means uh, you have to fight or you must fight. So they are helping kids who are undergoing chemotherapy to, to finance a sports therapy for these kids, which is not paid by insurances, but which is having a very positive impact on their healing process. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course, it's adjusted to their, to their state of health. Mm -hmm. And it ca can be very, very light, maybe just throwing balls and stuff, but uh, it has a positive impact on the healing process or on the recovery process. I love the idea of it. I mean, obviously, I'm not rich, I'm not making millions, but I still think, okay, how can I help? And what I do have is a really good network. So I think, okay, I can use my network to help. I can, I can spend time on talking to sponsors and raising money. And for me personally, I think it was a great, great feeling and great experience. It was a lot of hard work to, to organize my own charity event, but also it made me feel, feel more useful as a human being on this earth. So I can use my, all my, my network, my connections, and I can, have, I can make it have an impact on somebody else's life and I can, I can help. And I think that's, yeah, that's our purpose or that's what feels my purpose to, to help and to have an impact on others' life and to use, even though if I not have a lot of money myself, I can I have a good network and I can raise money and help and then to make, make the best out of it. And all this network is also thanks to tennis or to my sport. And um, that's really giving me a purpose. It's not that I don't have a purpose in life, but it's giving me a, just a, you know, a good feeling. Yeah, that, that, that's it. And I don't know if you are aware, but your energy now changed uh, completely. Not that before you didn't have energy, but now that you are sharing this, how you contributed and actually were being put in service for others that do not have maybe the finances or situations or life, uh, you know, adversities that are very difficult. And you used your situations where you were fighting so that you can help someone else on their, their, their route in life journey. That's uh, very great. Amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I, I think, yeah, that, that's what life's about, yeah? passing your experiences on. And, and, and again, I think it's, it's just so important to ask people that you admire or that, that, that have achieved things already. It's so, so interesting to talk to them. And mm. I'm telling you, if you ask people for advice, if you are, I, I think they will feel, yeah, they feel flattered and they will, they will talk to you. They will, they will answer your questions. And I think it's, it's just always important to stay, stay curious. Great. Uh, how are you curious in these uncertain times that are actually only presenting now uh, because we do not know when the tour is going to continue or when, why are you even training if the training, when it, when it will be available again? Uh, because now it hit home a lot of people in their mind and in their heart that we are actually living all the time in uncertain. We have routines and we have, you know, scheduled the tour is like it is, but uh, it's never certain in a way. So people are quite uh, struck now by this. Uh, how are you dealing with this uh, uncertainty and also with income and different sides of it? Yeah, so the good thing for me is that I'm interested in different fields and I'm still studying. So I always have something to do. I'm not feeling lost or even bored in any way. And um, yeah, the for me, the, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest fear or my worries was the financial side because I'm not having any income, but um, luckily um, getting support from the state. So that was a big relief when I knew, okay, I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to be left alone. And on the other hand, as, as bad as this crisis is, it has its bright sides in a way that you, you learn how to yeah, structure your day yourself or you have time for, for different things. Just can be just as simple as going for a walk or and experiencing nature. That's More normally, you, yeah, you normally you don't have time for that and making, making time for, I personally started to meditate more and practicing my right. awareness, practicing awareness in my everyday life. And um, yeah, I think, I think you can use this time wisely for yourself. I mean, I can use it for my studies, but also enjoying more time outside in the nature. The, the WTA has a section which is called Monday Motivation. Mm -hmm. And Billie Jean King says that champions adjust. 
and not only champions on the court, but also, let's say, champions in everyday life. Yeah? It's, it's easy to just whine about the current situation or to complain, but obviously it's not in our hands and we can't, can't do anything about it. So I think a champion in everyday life knows how to adjust and how to uh, get your advantage out of it. And that's something that I'm trying to do because I, I don't want to waste my energy on complaining about the situation if it, when it's not in my hands. It's not in my in my control, so I'm just really trying to make the best out of it, and that's something really important in life because there's always going to be things you cannot control. Uh, maybe for the finish, we connect something uh, that was happening between your career, uh, in a way happening that you were uh, branding yourself already, uh, because a lot of tennis players tend to forget that there was that will be a time after career. That will be a time after tennis, maybe, if they will not be open for being a coach or anything else, a part of a tennis uh, world. Uh, but you are doing a lot already with your studies, with management, with the foundation, with charity, with uh, your branding, some brands maybe being connected. You, you mentioned that you have a lot of uh, network, uh, friendships, relationships. Uh, so your future is bright. Uh, in a way, you sense it and that gives you, I think, certain confidence in yourself and in life, regardless of how uncertain everything is now. Uh, but uh, just maybe connect how you see the future for yourself and in general, and this, how you were doing already all these small steps in between your career and not saying, I don't have time to brand someone or I don't have time for this, but you were open, interested, curious, and uh, that made you a more holistic person. Yeah, that's also that I, uh, something that I learned during the WTA um, courses and classes. They're offering courses and classes that networking is really important. So once, let's say, you are going to this WTCA conference, be open, talk to people, listen to them, do some networking, try how you can maybe help others. And it's going to come back to you at some point. So that's what I, something that I thought is really, really important and um, branding myself in a way that I think, okay, figure out what's, what's your strength, what's your weakness. You know, companies are making the SWOT analysis. So what's your strength, what's your weakness, and that's something that you should also do as a person, not only as a tennis player, every person, yeah, to see, okay, that's the, maybe something I'm interested in and that's something that I'm good at and figure, figure that out and make, yeah, do... Do something or have a, have a good network and stay in touch with people who might be able to help you and maybe get already into, into some, some conversations or into talks with companies who would be able to help you to have maybe, let's say, just something as simple as an internship. Even if it's something that, yeah, not everybody likes, it's somehow how you present yourself on social media is also some, some kind of branding. And it's something you have to be very sensitive and careful about, in my opinion how you present yourself because nowadays everybody can Google you and then gets a picture of you. And uh, yeah, I think many people or even tennis players should be aware of it. Thank you for your time and everything that you shared. And uh, I believe that you will be amazing in the future as you were because uh, tennis sometimes uh, or most of the times neglects that uh, being top thousand in the world is a huge success. It anyway, is. And being open and as you are uh, intentional and curious about life, that, uh, that makes you a great person. Thank you. Thank you so much, you uh, for having me. You didn't even hear it. <laughs> I was, I was. She was in the background. Awesome. Good. That's going to, I mean, it's so important that uh, also other players hear that, that they are open to speak about this as I have a feeling inside, like everybody's like hiding. Like yes, if, but because they're so competitive. Yes, and if I say you know, something, like I'm gonna be weak then, you know, like everybody will know something about me that I don't wanna share. Yeah, and I don't wanna be too open so people will know how to beat me on the court, let's say, yeah, or I'm gonna have a disadvantage if I, if I, I don't know, if I speak, let's say, if I speak about how I practice, I'm gonna have a disadvantage because people know how to beat me or they will do the same and, it's just so competitive and everybody's so focused on themselves. Huh? Limited ego, yeah. because how can anyone beat you if they see how you train your serve? You yeah. <laughs> it's so much more that's in the background important. 
and they don't yeah. still see that that if you help if you share you're helping more to yourself you're advancing everybody mm. so yeah. if that's better, you need to get better mm. not in a competitive way but you need to grow yeah it's interesting but i know for me it was also a process and if obviously if i had known everything at the beginning of my career you would think okay maybe you would have been more successful and then somebody who is who already has such a good team around you and maybe sponsors and everything when you're 16 or when you're like Coco Golf, I think mm -hmm. her, her success is also a res result of having a really good team around her. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, maybe I didn't have that when I was 14 or 15, for example. We were so, not talking that our parents were also professional, you know, mm -hmm. athletes. So uh, some of the, I mean, some of the girls, some of the tennis players have, has this luck, have they this luck that the parents are maybe rich and they give them opportunity to to get good knowledge, mm -hmm. tennis knowledge, you know. Yeah. Or the parents are already in a long time in the sports. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. I might come back to this whenever it's possible because... Thank you for tuning in. Follow me on being the Genuine Athlete Instagram and Facebook page. Share, like and comment and be genuine all the way.